Episode 114, The Paradox. Welcome to The Paradox with your attending, Dr. Eric Larson. He is a practicing anesthesiologist and clinical assistant professor at Michigan State University College of Human Medicine. Listen in as he takes you behind the scenes of what practicing medicine in today's ever-changing world is like with another doctor. The Paradox is a fun and accidentally informative show for physicians, patients, or anyone who has ever found themselves in a waiting room. Welcome to The Paradox. I'm your host, Dr. Eric Larson. Thank you for joining me as we explore the U.S. medical system in a fun and informative format through expert analysis. Today's expert is a repeat guest, Dr. David Graham, an infectious disease physician from Billings, Montana, and we're going to discuss COVID-19 again, specifically focusing how, now that we're having vaccine rollout, we are entering the transitional phase. What do the new variants mean, and how is COVID-19 going to play out for the rest of this year, 2021? Dr. Graham is the author of From Killer to Common Cold, Herd Protection in the Transitional Phase in COVID-19, which is narrated by yours truly. Overall, it's a great discussion where we discuss really all the aspects of COVID-19, both the political, scientific, and sociological effects of COVID-19, and how things are playing out. But before we get to that, I want to once again thank my patrons at patreon.com slash the paradox. There they are financially supporting with a small monthly pledge to support the production and promotion of the show. I'd also like to thank the Dr. Podcast Network for increasing the reach of the show, and you can find more of the great podcasts at drpodcastnetwork.com. We're a month into 2021. You're finally ready to commit to this year being better than the last, but you're still spending your evenings catching up on notes when you could be leaving work with a clean slate. On Time MD teaches physicians critical time management strategies tailored specifically for the unique demands physicians face. Strategies cover the exam room, inbox and EHR, meetings, and more. Popular module, How to Delegate Without Dumping, addresses how to delegate tasks to your staff in a way that doesn't make them feel dumped on, but inspires them to do their best work. Course creator, Phil Boucher, pediatrician and podcaster, wants you to join other physicians who understand the value of their time, but are struggling to make a clear and executable plan of action. Join today and save 15% by using the code 2021 at checkout. You also get a money-back guarantee if you don't reclaim three hours a week in the first two months. Now is your chance to join On Time MD and reclaim your time for good. Go to drpodcastnetwork.com slash ontimemd to get started. Finally, if you're not yet subscribed to the show, please do so on your favorite podcast player and leave it a five-star review. It'd be greatly appreciated. But without further ado, Dr. David Graham, author of From Killer to Common Cold, Herd Protection in the Transitional Phase, and our discussion about, hey, we're in the transitional phase. What's up with that? Enjoy. Well, I'm here again with my good friend and high school classmate, Dr. David Graham, who's an infectious disease physician in Billings, Montana. He's the author of From Killer to Common Cold, Herd Protection in the Transitional Phase of COVID-19, narrated by yours truly. He's also the narrator and the author of the thefiphysician.com, where he does a lot of financial updates. And also, he's been writing quite a bit over the last year, I suppose, and that's where we first sort of connected on COVID-19. And so, Dave, thanks very much for coming back on the show. Hey, it's good to be back, Eric. So we've actually, this is your fourth round. You're, you're now the, you know, you're winning in the sense that you've been Woo-hoo. on my show more than anyone else. <laughs> so you've been on episodes 86, 96, and 101. Winning. And yeah, <laughs> winning, losing, it just depends how you look at it or point of view. Uh, I think, you know, what I'd like you to do, and I, by you, I mean the listener, I'd like you to go back and look at those, those episodes and listen to them. It gives you a background and sort of primer for what we're going to discuss today, but we're going to continue talking about COVID-19. At some point, we'll actually talk, discuss finances uh, later on. But right now, let's talk about COVID-19 because that's what everyone's talking about. When I'm in the operating room, all anyone wants to talk about is COVID-19, you know, what to do, what sort of the strategies going on, what's going on in schools. I mean, it drives people bananas. Uh, sports are shut down, and we're much more restrictive here in Michigan than I imagine you are in Montana, obviously. And even states just close to us, like Indiana and Ohio, are far more open. My parents are in Florida, and it's open in the sense that there aren't any restrictions on anything that I can that I can gather. Although most people walk around with masks on and they tend to avoid large groups and stuff like that. When we talked to you initially, you you sort of coined the term or maybe you didn't coin the term, but the transitional phase. And so that was the discussion that we're going to go from an epidemic or a pandemic 
to endemic, which means that this coronavirus, the SARS-CoV-2, will become ubiquitous. It's going to be circulating with throughout the popula- human population for now until at some point if it became eradicated, perhaps. But right now, there's certainly no signs that that's happening. And we have to get to the point where we go from these sort of mass um, infections and hospitalizations, ICU stays and everything, to a point where it exists. And not only does it prevent clogging up the hospitals, but we get to a point where uh, the infection itself is different than what it is now. Why don't you just briefly go through, I guess, that transition, and then we'll move on from there in the discussion of COVID-19. So brief, briefly go through just about everything, huh? Right. Just so. solve the problem for us. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we have solved the problem here, right? Cases are going away. So this is a novel virus, and it's in a family that we know quite a bit about because there's four endemic Um, what we call common cold coronaviruses that have already made this transition, right? So those endemic common cold coronaviruses presumably didn't evolve with humans, they jumped species. And in fact, we know one jumped species from cows back in the um, late 1800s, and now that's the common cold. So what we're seeing with SARS-CoV-2 as opposed to SARS-CoV-1, which was a failed pandemic, right? That that failed because we could contain it. Um, and MERS, MERS is a failed pandemic because humans are dead, ends ho- dead end hosts for it. So what we're seeing with SARS-CoV-2 is that eventually enough adults will get it or get the vaccine such that there will be herd protection. And the only thing that this can be then is the common cold in kids, just like the other common cold coronaviruses out there. Right. And so I think that's important to the, the terminology used is, is one that you don't hear much. You said it uses the term herd protection. It's in the title of your book. If you have not yet listened to the book or read the book, uh, I'd highly recommend it. It's, it's interesting because you wrote that probably six months ago, I think, yeah. well, give, or, give or take. And it's almost like you, it's, I don't consider you, you a genius or a savant, but you took the, you were able to look at what's happening pre, prior experience and just sort of just, I don't know, remove biases or kind of get a step, take a step back from what was going on in the yeah. world and just kind of saying, this is probably where I think things are going. I felt like a lot of times people were just living in the moment as far as whether you're a public health official, you know, wear masks, distance and those sorts of things, as opposed to sort of thinking, how is this going to play out? you know, specifically with regards to the virus. Well, and what's frustrating about this, Eric, is like even Michael Osterholm in his most recent podcast, he says he has no idea why waves come and go. So using herd immunity, you cannot describe why a wave comes and goes, but using herd protection or population protection, you can, it it models why these waves happen. So even these disease chasers, the greatest of our, you know, time, don't understand this. So, you know, how can us mere mortals understand this? The greatest of all times don't understand it. Well, I was really surprised when Ulcerholm seems to seem not to understand that. Is it because they're not clinicians? Like, you know, I think, I think people are under the mistaken belief that epidemiologists are clinicians. They're, they're physicians, right? And they're not, yeah, they're right. statisticians, they're, uh, you know, mathematicians or whatever. They're, I mean, they obviously, understand population health, they understand sort of underlying really mathematical models for sort of how things spread and and grow and and wane. But I would think this would be a fairly basic thing to understand how you get these mini waves of infection. Even if you have something like, say, mumps, right? We know at some point when the the vaccination rate drops below a certain level, the population becomes at risk for like a, a little, an epidemic locally, regionally. It happens, it sort of burns up its fuel, and it goes away, right? I mean, so it's surprising that that sort of same thinking would not be, you know, that the, the, we can extrapolate and think, well, it's the same sort of phenomena going on now. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't know how much I want to throw epidemiologists under the bus. Well, at least this early in the, in the podcast, but, <laughs> but you know, there a lot of them are chronic disease epidemiologists, right? So they're talking about smoking and heart disease and things like that. So, you know, honestly, you have to understand evolution and the interaction of a virus and a host. And not only that, a novel virus, right? So this is something that we've seen in HIV, but really no other time has anyone in our generation actually seen the interplay of a novel virus. It's actually actively selecting out people's of our, people in our population still, Eric, right? So there, there yeah. are 
that are more susceptible to COVID-19 that are going to die from this. You know, and then the real question is, even if we vaccinate them, if they are genetically or molecularly susceptible, are they still going to die from this? So that, that's the question I, I don't really know. So, you know, it, it is a novel thing. It is something that, that you need to have a, a, a understanding from different things. You can't just be, you know, studying. And the models, you know, you and I have talked about how horrific the models have been, you know, since the beginning. So, so yeah, so it's, it's a complicated thing, obviously. And it hasn't happened, right? Like you mentioned, I mean, when people, when you mentioned epidemiologists looking at chronic disease, again, you know, looking at, say, polio or um, mumps, measles, rubella, whatever, HIV, hantavirus. I mean, all these things are things that are chronic and some, like you said, chronic, they've been around for a while. So they're somewhat established within the community or they're limited because of their inability to spread. Right. So you can, it's probably easier to model that than, than I think probably the di- the dynamism of populations is what's so complicated, right? Because you look at, you know, you could say, well, we've got a controlled, we've got, we've got the, the outbreak controlled in this County. Well, people can just walk into the next county. They can walk. They can drive over two more states. They can fly, and especially in our country, where it's, there's so much freedom of movement, where we expect that even when it's even when it's diminished than it, like it is now, people are still moving around all the time and mixing. And when you have, as you mentioned before, when you have a virus that is that is able to spread, when people are not recognizing that they're sick, that's what really that's the hardest part, right? The viral load is is enormous before you actually exhibit symptoms oftentimes. And so that's when you're probably, I guess we don't know for sure, but that's probably when you're most infectious. I mean, it makes sense, right? That when you have the highest viral load, you're going to be more likely to transmit to someone else. And then you're symptomatic, you know, two days later, three days later, whatever. And so that's the, it makes it easy to, to spread. And that's part of the genius of this virus. If we were to, you know, give it any sort of intelligence. Yeah, it's a genius virus. And then also, you know, the other, there, there's many problems, but the two other problems that kind of come to mind is that people compare this to influenza and influenza p- uh, pandemics. And like these variants that we're seeing and everyone is so worried about, they're trying to jam this into the influenza model um, when they're worried about these variants. And that's not how coronaviruses work. You know, what makes influenza the greatest of all time is that it can escape your immune system yet still remain perfectly infectious, right? That That is what sets influenza apart from every other virus in the world, just how good it does that very thing. So, you know, we can't use models from influenza. We can't think about influenza when we're thinking about this and try to, to come up with some sort of successful way to see how variants are going to affect this. And then the other problem, you know, is that people are viewing this as the pandemic. You know, this is the, the pandemic in the United States, whereas you know what's going on in Grand Rapids is totally different than what's going on in the UP, is totally different than what's going on in, in Detroit. Right. So even though, you know, the virus doesn't care where you live, it doesn't care about boundaries. These epidemics are local. And and I've been preaching that since April that, you know, we got to look at local rather than even, you know, regional is important. But, you know, who cares what the data is in the United States? It's just irrelevant to what's happening in in your locality, in your hospital, in your community. Right. And I think that's been a problem from the very beginning that we have fairly clunky ways of trying to control spread. You know, when you have it on a state level, even if you're, maybe if you're a tiny state like Rhode Island or something, you could you could argue that that's pretty much all the same area. But for the most part, many states are tremendously different from one part to the other, urban, rural, yeah. in between, you know, thousands of miles, uh, you know, a thousand miles from northern Southern California. I mean, you can, can't imagine there's any sort of relation between those two. I do like the the thought of using if influenza models along for coronavirus I mean, I think it's sort of akin to, say, having mammals, right? That they're both mammals, but a chipmunk is not going to behave anything like a lion. And so to, yep. the the idea that you can say, well, I'm going to look at the behavior of a chipmunk and think, I know how a lion behaves, right? Mm-hmm. We know you that on a face that they're totally different. And there's every reason to think that these would behave differently as well. There's Now, you could probably say you could make similarities between various types of big cats, like tigers and lions, right? But maybe not so much with, you know, the, the elephant and the, and the tiger. So... I don't know. That's I try and simplify things to make it easy for me to kind of figure things out. But I think that's sort of how I like to to look at something like this. Makes sense to me. When we're looking at the virus right now, whereas we're speaking now, it's January twenty seventh. I just had my second jab, as they'd say in England. But I had I had it yesterday. It really uh, whew, today was a rough day. I was fine yesterday, and uh, I thought I had the genius idea of getting my initial injection in my leg, 
on the a couple of months, like a month ago. Because I, as an anesthesiologist, you want to be able to use your arms and intubate and stuff like that. So that I usually get in the the arm when I get the the influenza vaccine. But I thought ah, I'm just going to get in my leg, which was fine. I just limped for a day and a half, right? And, huh, and they actually let you get it in the leg. They did. They let me get the vastus laterals. Huh. I saw a surgeon who actually did the same thing. I thought, well, that's a good idea. So that's what I did. And partly that was because my wife had it in her arm and every time she rolled under her arm, it woke her up because it hurt so much. I mean, it really felt, I don't know what your experience was, but for me, it felt like someone really unloaded as much, like with a lead pipe against my muscle, just in that one spot, which, Mm -hmm. you know, got better in two days. It was not a big deal, but it was, I mean, it was impressive. And today I got my vaccination yesterday and today I just felt, suddenly I got the fever. I definitely had a fever. I got sort of myalgias and fatigue and just felt kind of crummy. Took some ibuprofen. And now I think I feel like I've sort of turned the corner from my vaccination yes, yesterday, and I suspect I'll be totally fine tomorrow. Um, so anyway, that backdrop means that the vaccine's out. Uh, we talked before messenger RNA. I've talked before in the show with Dr. Tim Hindmarsh about just the basic sort of science with messenger RNA. And there are a couple of things with the vaccine. Uh, I try and tell people, much like you mentioned in your book, that you're going to encounter coronavirus one of two ways. One is through a vaccine. You're going to get immune response there, or you're going to meet it in the wild. You got it. But it, fundamentally, you're going to get it. Yep. Or, or, and and actually, probably vaccinated, you're still going to get it <laughs> at some point. Our hope is that, of course, that you'll be less sick. And it seems like that was the end point they used for the vaccinations initially, right? I mean, it was that people don't get as sick. They're not end up in the hospital. So that considered it a, a successful vaccine. We had no idea if it was actually sterilizing, meaning that you couldn't actually transmit the virus. You know, you didn't actually get infected. With the vaccines, how does that change the trajectory of things right now as far as you, or is this sort of like you, when you're talking about the transitional phase, I guess maybe explain how the vaccines play into that. Honestly, we stumbled onto some amazingly effective vaccines here with the Moderna and the Pfizer, the mRNA vaccines being, you know, 90, 95% um, effective. That technology was the one that got to the market the quickest was really a godsend because, you know, if you look at some other things that they've tried in the past against SARS and MERS, that technology didn't work. Yeah. And um, what what was it? Um, was it Merck that um, canned their two vaccines more recently because they just don't work, right? So that we got a vaccine that just happened to be probably the best vaccine we could have imagined um, right up front for this really moved this transitional phase. It moved it from everyone getting this, you know, getting the natural infection over the course of three to five years down to literally, I think probably sometime next year, we'll get everyone that wants to be vaccinated, vaccinated, right? So that'll take your immunity in the community. And um, if 50% of people get vaccinated, well, you know, you already got 30% of people in a lot of communities that have had this disease. And I don't know why we're not talking about that. You know, you hear about all these vaccination campaigns. Well, what about people that have had natural disease, right? So let's take, for instance, you know, Los Angeles, they think a third of people in Los Angeles have had COVID in this most recent wave, right? Well, if we're vaccinating, you know, that population, then fully a third of people that we're vaccinating probably don't get a community benefit from the vaccination right? If they're already immune to it, what's the point? Sure, we can give them a booster dose. We can yada, yada, yada. But already we're kind of quote, unquote, wasting vaccine on a third of people. You know, you get 50% plus whatever percent of people have the disease but didn't get vaccinated. You know, that gets you right to 60, 70% of people that have had this before. So then, you know, that is the immunity that actually herd immunity doesn't take um, vaccination in, into effect. It doesn't take natural immunity into effect. So this is why I don't like herd immunity is you take a totally naive population, what percent do you need to vaccinate? What percent do you need to get to get the infection, assuming that it's 100% effective for it to go away? And that's the thing that you know we're talking about here is that you can probably spread this even after you've been vaccinated right? You can still get infected with this. This is a mucosal virus. It lives outside of you, right? It lives in your nose and then it invades your cells, but it doesn't really get in your bloodstream where these antibodies are, right? So I'm mm-hmm. making, I'm getting a vaccine. I'm getting an infection. I'm getting antibodies, which are, are in my bloodstream. Is it actually making IgA antibodies, which get outside of my body and attack this, you know, in my mucosal surfaces, which, which is where the business end of this virus is, right? The vaccine 
stumbling upon this amazingly good efficacious vaccine has taken us down from, you know, five years down to like a year and a half. So I, I think we got another year, Eric, of this. And then at that point, things will be as normal as the CDC lets things be. Yeah, that's a, the political question is entirely different. We can discuss that in a little bit. So, I mean, what I'm hearing you say is is basically we need to have 60, 70 percent of the population. There's no way for us outside of people who have been tested positive and know that they had it. Our assumption is that a lot of people had it and we, they just don't know it. They, they right. maybe had a fever for an hour or something and they were yep. sort of mildly sick. And so once you get enough people who have got either natural immunity or vaccine immunity, that you will stop filling up the hospital. Because, I mean, I, th I still go back to the very beginning of this pandemic. I, you know, that was what the, the benchmark was for success. It was, I mean, obviously yeah. people are dying from this, but what we're really concerned about is the fact that people are getting to the hospital and there's no room for regular stuff. All the other, the strokes, the heart attacks, all the other sort of problems that people have normally. And that I, th I feel like if we get to a point where we've got enough people to prevent the hospital from getting flooded with patients, then we can ease things up. Yeah. But do you think Michigan is going to do that, right? Is California going to do that? And that, that's really where the rubber hits the road here is that what level of cases is okay for your governor? What level well, of death is okay for your governor? Right. And before we get to political, I guess my, my question, which I did not phrase very well was, you know, when it comes to what sort of level do we need to have to prevent these big mass infections, right? Within a community. Mm -hmm. Like if you say, we got hit really hard in November. Um, we were in the upper Midwest where we got hit really hard. Not as bad as South Dakota, but we had a lot of cases. It's now subsided significantly. We're our positivity rate for whatever that's worth is like 6% or something. Now we're pretty much, you know, on the mend, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Now that's with all the mitigation things, measures in place is people acting, whatever, you know, however they were. Uh, I don't truly think it's a lot different than it was two months ago. I mean, that's my hunch. So why did the wave go away then, Eric? Well, I, I mean, I look at it as like a forest fire, right? Like if you have an area that is that is at risk for getting engulfed in flames, like you have out California, you have temperatures right, you have high winds, and you have tons of debris that's on the ground. A spark happens, lightning bolt, some person, idiot, leaves, you know, starts a campfire, doesn't attend it. The fire goes up and it starts consuming all the, all the, the wood around, right? At some point, it runs out of fuel. Now, maybe that's because people move some of the fuel, maybe they put fire lines in place, right? I mean, as I try and take the analogy even further, and at some point, you just the, there's just not enough to burn. Now, it's possible that this fire jumps to another spot where it finds more fuel, but, but as long as that fuel's gone, then, then it just dies off. I mean, I, I think that's sort of, that's even when you look at, I remember in biology, when you look at, uh, there's like a graph with, I think it's like wolves and mice or something. And so... When you get a massive amount of mice, the amount of number of wolves increases because there's more food for them. As soon as they eat all the mice, the wolves die off because there's not as much food. And they sort of reach some equilibrium and balance, which is, I think, fundamentally kind of what a virus is. So using your forest fire, though, then why did the fire reignite, reignite in Arizona? Why did it reignite in England and Spain? You know, why do you get second waves then in that same area that it burned before? If, if the reason why it went out is because you burned all the, 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 the timber. Because you because the, all the timber wasn't available, right? I mean, I think if you, it's hard to take the, the analogy is not good in the sense, right? Because essentially, what it is is people got it, and then they and then other people who were susceptible, for whatever reason, they sort of re-entered that sort of milieu of people who are, are potentially going to be new fuel for this this virus, right? I think at some point you've had enough people who get it, and then there's just not enough for it to to grow exponentially anymore. Yeah. So I can't say specifically what it is. Maybe it's people traveling. Maybe it's people gathering in groups for the holidays. Maybe it's the weather. Maybe it's the fact they're gathering indoors. I mean, all those things probably contribute to it. Yeah. And the and as you mentioned in your piece, that which will be linked at the paradox.com slash 114, it is, there are both inter, what's the term? Inter and extra personal reasons. I can't remember the exact term, but there are things that are due to our environment and there are things due to our in, us individually that contribute to the uh, reproductive rate. Right. And, and the reason why I'm challenging a little bit on this is because you said, I really don't see anything different now than, you know, a couple months ago. But that's the thing is that the, the fire was burning and it went away. And then if we 
stop doing what we were doing that made the fire stop burning, it's going to come back again until you have enough people that are immune to this, either via natural infection or or vaccination. So I am pushing back because I think people did do different things. That's why the wave went away. So thousands of people made a hundred different small choices every day. And and because the thing is too, is that, you know, say you do a hundred things every day, there's only one of them that might cause you to get infected. Well, which one is it? Right. Right. If if you knew which one thing it was, you could do 99 things you normally do. um, And then you just don't do that one thing. But the thing is, is that you have to reduce your risk enough, enough times and enough people have to do that, you know, that you get this kind of stochastic nonlinear feedback that actually stops the exponential process. So that's the problem is that this, this is not, you know, this is random, but it's randomly random, right? The, the feedback loop isn't there in a one-to-one relation. It is just that a thousand people do a hundred different things every day and then that is what gets rid of the, the the fire to burn. But then when we all just change slightly, we do things just slightly different, thousands of us do a hundred things just slightly different, that's enough to restart the fire right exactly where it was again. So that is the extra person dynamics. That's the, the host to host dynamics that allows it to spread. Whereas the intra person that, you know, your immunity, that's your vaccination. Right. So as we get more people vaccinated, we can do more quote unquote normal things. We can go to games again. We can go to concerts again and not overwhelm the healthcare system. Right. And that's the goal. I agree. Yeah. Well, and I, I like how you put that too. I guess when it comes to the, the decisions, you know, it doesn't, because it's a fair, well, without a doubt, it's a very contagious disease or virus. Let's, I probably shouldn't call it a disease, but virus. And it doesn't take much for it to to burst up into flames real quick, and it almost is a raging fire, right? Before people even recognize it, and so you can go from two percent, two percent positivity rate, three percent, two and a half percent, and then suddenly it's eight, and then it, you say, "Oh, we got to slow down," and then it's like twenty five yep. and thirty percent, right? I mean, it happens real quick. People adjust their behavior, but it takes a while for that all to sort of burn itself out, right? I mean, right. that's sort right. of the what you did mention your piece what i was a little curious about is you said we suspect don't know but we suspect people have natural immunity to this sars cov2 from previous exposure to other coronaviruses the other endemic coronaviruses it's a guess i mean i think it's probably a reasonable guess but that since immunity wanes those people who were previously immune in april 20, 2020 right well that immunity may have waned now and so although we say oh well a bunch of people had it there actually may be maybe more people entering the you know the consumable fuel stage that weren't there before. Is that pretty accurate? Yeah, yeah. Well, so so there's there's a couple things going on. What you're talking about, say you know like a daycare teacher or an elementary school teacher or a pediatric emergency room doctor. I mean, they're spit on with these common cold coronaviruses <laughs> every year all the time, but those viruses disappeared. Right. So what we're doing in general with respiratory hygiene, which we probably should have been doing every influenza season, you know, for the last hundreds of years, which we, we hadn't been doing, but influenza has gone this year. There, there is no influenza in my state yet this year. None of these common cold coronaviruses are around. So if there is some relative um, pre-existing partial immunity to the other beta coronaviruses, that allowed you to, you know, have a blunted response to COVID-19, those coronaviruses aren't around anymore. So perhaps there is a segment of population that's vulnerable now that wasn't vulnerable a year ago. So that that's something really interesting to think about. But then also, let me ask you this, why do one and two-year-olds not get common cold coronavirus infections? You know, yeah. and they don't really get SARS-CoV-2 either, I, I hate to say that because you're going to get smacked on the back of your head if you say something like that. Because yeah. there are some cases, right? Somewhere. Th- right? There are, there are. And, and you know, some kids die from this. It's true. But almost uniformly, young kids don't get this. Why? Why? Why don't y- young kids get COVID-19? You know, young being uh, a year, two years, three years old. Right. So no one has explained that. And, and, and it's like you can't even talk about it without that being political and, you know, you, you getting smacked. So, well, and I was I think I was reading it. I think it was a science article, but they were talking about, um, you know, when it comes to it may have been the article that you sent me 
a week or two ago, or it may have been linked through your through your article uh, that you wrote on the FIPhysician.com. But I think it was something along the lines that once you hit 15, you seroconvert in the sense that you don't produce IgM anymore, which is the sort of that's that's the antibody that you make if it's your first time being exposed to something, right? And right. so the, the assumption there is that, well, everybody's seen every coronavirus by that point. Like every right. kid has seen it. And so they don't really, well, they've had it. And so potentially these kids have gotten it. They're producing antibodies maybe to SARS-CoV-2 even, and we, they just don't even exhibit any symptoms for whatever reason. I mean, whether it's a competitive issue with the within their uh, respiratory tract because they've got other coronavirus. I mean, you pick up any kid, they're just wet. I and mean, that's why I think of like two-year-olds. They're just wet. Uh-huh. It's, and I mean, is it that? I don't know. I don't th- and I think you're to your point. I don't think we know and I don't know yeah. that we'll know for a while. Yeah, so that's the fascinating thought experiment. Say I take any of these benign common cold coronaviruses and and, and I make, you know, thousands of elderly people magically never have seen that virus before. What percent would die from the common cold um, that haven't seen it multiple times before in their life? And I almost bet you, you would have the same sort of curve mortality that you get with SARS-CoV-2 that you do with these other endemic common cold coronaviruses. The difference is, is they've all been exposed to it many different times during their life and their immune system accounts for that. The only pushback I give you to that is that it it probably, if you look at the previous coronavirus, like I think the last one was, we think it was the late 1800s that it sort of jumped from cows to humans, right? That we didn't have any, there are no reports of massive, you know, there's not mortality numbers that exist. Now, you could argue, well, people weren't as old, and so they weren't as with, they didn't have as much chronic conditions, there wasn't much obesity, so maybe if there was, there would have been more death. Probably hard to say, right? I mean, these are, this conjecture is, well, it's just conjecture. But but what's interesting, Eric, is is that, you know, every infection we have in humans, it came from animals. It jumped species and came from animals. Right. You know, there, there's nothing that we had um, humans, not, I shouldn't say nothing. Every infection you can think of, it started out as a novel infection that jumped from um, animals to humans. You know, that that is the story of our agriculturalism, right? Moving from yeah. um, hunter-gatherers to um, dense communities. So, Yeah, and Jared Diamond in the book that I read a long time ago, where he talks yeah. about sort of the the competitive advantages that certain civilizations had. Yeah. One of the things he mentioned, and you know, I don't know what you think about his book in general, but makes sense that there was a competitive advantage for being agriculturally based because you had obviously calories of, of present, but you also had diseases, which wiped out a lot of your population. However, when you encountered populations that had never seen those, they got decimated and they're easy to conquer, right? I mean, that's sort of from like a strength standpoint, right. they were easy to sort right. of wipe out. Right. Guns, germs, and steel. So what yeah, there you go. That's it. You're up to conquer North America was the germs. It was not our civilization. It wasn't our superiority. It was our germs that we had from being agrarian. So let's talk about masks. Uh, Just today, Fauci came out and said, today or yesterday, I don't know. I can't keep track of these things, but he said, now you need to wear two masks, maybe. And then Cena puts up a thing saying three masks. I mean, I- But but I've been vaccinated. Why do I have to wear a mask at all? Right. Well, right. I mean, is your is your opinion of the mask, the double, triple masking, that it's not that much of a, a big deal? I mean, my hunch is, and I can't prove this, obviously, is that the mask, although helpful, people t- can have behaviors that counteract the fact that they have masks on that actually make it more detrimental. And by that, I mean, the masks work, but now I'm a close talker uh, and I'm actually, or I hang out in the room with you for an hour as opposed to before I would just, you know, passing because I didn't have any, maybe feeling any protection. It's sort of like having an umbrella, but then never opening it, right? Or something like that, uh, and you still get wet. So yeah. do, you, do you think that's sort of the case, or do you think it's really a, a usefulness for double, triple masking? So there is a clear efficacy difference in the quality of mask you have, right. um, and it drops off really rapidly until you get to, you know, gators, which essentially don't do anything, right? <laughs> so if we go to this model where you can do 99 things wrong, but it doesn't matter because that's not the risky event, when it matters, we want people wearing quality masks, right? When it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter what you wear, right? right. So the difficulty is, is that, you know, when our case, you know, per 100,000, when we're at 100 or 150 per 100,000, literally people are walking down the street getting infected. There is so much virus in your community that if you don't perfectly wear an excellent mask, 
you're going to get COVID. This virus is so contagious, there's not a rock big enough that you can hide behind to not get this virus <laughs> when it's in your community like that. Okay. You know, versus if you're at, you know, 10 per 100,000 and you could not wear a mask, you could half ass a mask most of the time and you'd be just fine. Right. Because again, you're not in those situations um, where it's around. If you're drowning in a pool, it really doesn't matter what kind of life jacket you have because you can swim to the end. If you're drowning in the ocean, you want to have a pretty damn good life jacket, don't you? Yeah. So maybe that's the difference. Well, then the other thing is schools, right? Um, schools and, and athletics, I think, are big things in every community. I, th- I think there's, and I don't know if you agree with this, the evidence that there's a large transmission from young children, and we'll talk about primary, we're just talking about fifth graders and, lo- and less. So like what? 12 year olds, 10, 10, 11 year olds, maybe, and younger, that there's not a whole lot of, just, that they don't seem very efficient at transmitting the virus. Again, this doesn't mean they can never do it, right? I mean, as yeah. you always give me a caveat. for saying on that, aren't you? I know, right. Yeah. It's just like saying kids are usually totally fine. And yes, they do get really sick. They can yes. die. Right. Uh, it's a tragedy. But you look at the, the death numbers, and I think for like young children, it's like 100 in the whole country of mm-hmm. uh, how many hundreds of thousands of people have died in the United States? It's well, hundreds of thousands, right? We've had a minuscule percentage of people who are really younger and, you know, you can argue whether vaccinations are you know necessary or something like that, but what's your, what's your thought on schools? And I think by extension, what is your thought on vaccinating young children? Because that's the next, that'll be the next excuse not to have schools open because, Oh, well, the teachers are vaccinated and the janitors, but, oh, well, the kids could still be walking around with COVID. It is a hard decision that has to be made community by community. So in, in a way, I'm glad that in some aspects there wasn't national top from bottom guidance because I think you can get these things wrong on a, on, on a local level pretty quickly. But, you know, here in my community, we stayed open. We did not close. We kept the schools open. We monitored. It got um, hairy for a while, especially because, you know, before this wave, the quote unquote upper Midwest, I mean, we were we were pants on fire here. We, we, we were all hands on deck. The hospitals were jammed full. There were a lot of cases here, but we kept the schools open because every decision you make is a trade off. Right. Yeah. And, and that's what we have to understand is that if these kids aren't in school, there are a lot of negative effects from that, right? It's not a matter of how many kids die. It's a matter of how many families don't get fed, how many suicides, how many physical abuse cases, how many other things happen, and how many kids miss out, you know, on socialization and and reading and learning, right? So I don't think we should have closed schools and, and, you know, honestly, shame on the big cities for closing schools. It's something we, we got to figure out a way to get this open. And if that means vaccinating um, school teachers, you know, really quickly, rapidly, I, I'm all for that. I think that's a great idea. You know, I don't know if you've noticed how many people are raising their hand to get this vaccine, trying to jump in line. It, it, it's a pretty common thing for people to say X, Y, Z is why I need to get in line before, you know, you. Yeah. So it, it's a balancing act, but it needs to be done on a community by community level. So then you look at universities, and I guess my feeling on, on this, it, much like schools, like I, I'm worried there are a lot of schools that are going to insist on vaccination for children. And let's say we had enough vaccine sitting around in July and August, which I don't know that we will. We might, maybe perhaps the Johnson Johnson's going to be out. It's the one, you know, the one injection, and you don't need to, a, a series. And I, in general, the messenger RNA are quicker to produce. And so I guess potentially you could get enough and let's say you could logistically get it done, but we don't have any testing on anyone under the age of, I think 16 is where they sort of have the cutoff right now for, um, for give, for administering the vaccine. Do you think there's any, I mean, is there really any use in vaccinating like a four-year-old? It, because I mean, there's clearly is it there clearly there's utility in doing it for flu, right? I don't think there's any question influenza it is helpful to have kids get vaccinated for the flu because they are absolutely a vector for disease spread within families and communities, but it doesn't seem like it is for this. And so do you think there's any point to it? Yeah. So, you know, again, we're, we're getting back to trade-offs, right? And, and you know, as well as any other physician that nothing we do is entirely benign, right? Everything has um, positives and negatives. If you're telling me that I am going to give this unstudied injection to a four-year-old that has a 0.00 
zero percent chance of um, <laughs> you know dying from this disease, boy, that that's a tough decision to make, isn't it? Now, if this kid lives with a multi generational family and there are people at risk of dying if this kid brings the virus home, you know that that needs to be considered as well. But I even up to college age kids, I, I don't know that I would run out and start vaccinating college age kids at this point, you know, and, and, and as long as they don't go home to visit grandma, you know, between semesters. Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think you're going to without a doubt, all colleges are going to require vaccination to return in the fall for semester. I mean, wow, you think whether so? that's, I don't think there's any question that'll be the case. Wow. OK. Yeah. Old prediction. You heard it here. Yeah, you heard it here. I. Yeah, no, that's going to be fascinating because like, you know, Costco will probably require it, right? So you're going to have to prove your vaccine status to fly, to go to Costco, to um, go to the Super Bowl, right? So that's inevitable that that's that's going to be happening. But you you think even colleges will will do that? Well, that's different. I mean, I I think, you know, walking to Costco or getting a ticket at Ticketmaster or getting on a plane... I'll say this. I, I mean, it, all those things are possible to happen. But I think, you know, colleges, they already require vaccinations and vaccination series, immunization series, I should say. Uh, so it wouldn't be surprising they would add that to the list. Uh, you know, it'd be, it'd be easy for them to do. We don't have any sort of thing like that for all these other sort of activities. And so it'd be a totally novel uh, novel use of immunization, right? To say, you can't go to, this it dated me, you know, Metallica concert unless you have Right. Unless you have a vaccination or something to to COVID. I, I'll just tell you what my ideal would be. And I, I tell people this all the time and it's pie in the sky, I realize. But my assumption is once once there's been enough vaccine for everyone to get. And I don't know when that'll be. I'm hoping it'll be summer. I think that might be ambitious, but it's not totally unreasonable if Johnson Johnson gets approved and they can roll out a bunch of doses, especially since you're not going to be vaccinating children. I mean, you're not vaccinating 330 million people. You're vaccinating, I mean, the, the maximum would is, I should have looked this up ahead of time, but it's probably 250 million people or something like that. Yeah, right. Still so 500 million doses is what you need unless... Um, you right. Know, or the Johnson Johnson. Johnson. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so let's say you have, let's say by July, you've pretty much vaccinated everyone who, you have enough vaccine and you vaccinated everyone who wants it. You're never going to get to an adoption rate probably more than 60% of people who want to get the vaccine is my guess. Now, you can maybe impose mandates or some, you know, make it compel people to do it, I suppose, by, again, by like saying you can't do anything unless you have proof that you've been vaccinated. I don't think it'll come to that in this country, but I could be wrong. I couldn't imagine any of this stuff that's happened before. But I feel like at that point, you can safely say, let's say we get another wave. 60% of our community or 65% is vaccinated or had a prior infection at a minimum, even if they don't have antibodies, we could say they're probably going to have T cell response, which is what we're anticipating. Most of these vaccines will cause. And even if you lost the antibodies to other coronaviruses, maybe there's a T cell response that provides some partial immunity. You're not going to have these massive waves going into the hospital. You'll have people in the hospital all the time with COVID, uh, but they're not going to be, you know, you're not going to have to, like we had up seven ICUs opened up from our usual previous two which is interesting too, be when you talk about ICU capacity, that it is a very fungible number, right? I mean, we can convert right. all sorts of things and, and have a lot more capacity than we think. But once you've had an opportunity for everyone to get it, who wants it, then I think you just kind of say, you just kind of let it roll. I mean, at that point, right? Because you say, you know, probably people who have, uh, who've been vaccinated, they're not going to get as sick. They probably still can transmit to other people. That Those are the risks. You know, if you haven't been vaccinated, there are going to be people who don't reply, respond to the virus, the vaccine. There are going to be people who are, for whatever reason, um, they have some immune problems and they're just and they're they can't get it. Or, but those, but you cannot run your entire society based on a very limited portion of people, right? I mean, I realize it's a political decision at this point, but I feel like at that point you can say, you know, you've had your chance. It's all it's out there. You can get it any time if you decide later you want to you want to do something differently. But we can't. We can't shut down everything. Schools in the whole kit and caboodle just because, you know, we can't ever have another COVID case because, like you mentioned, it's never going away. There will always be COVID now. And you're laughing because I know this. Well, no, you said you had your chance, you know, so yeah. so, you know, we're, we're going to open up because you had your chance. But but so so think about this, Eric, you know, you're a healthcare care provider. If you were going to go into the room of someone who had chicken pox or disseminated shingles, you would have to wear an N95 and a gown and a glove. Right. 
how much sense does that make because you're immune to chickenpox, right? But does the CDC care that you're immune to chickenpox? No, you still have to wear an N95 and gowns and gloves, right? So this is what worries me is that the CDC is all about risk elimination. It's not about risk reduction. It's not about you had your chance. It's about no risk is acceptable, right? So there is no risk that you're gonna get chickenpox if you're immune by going in the room of someone who has chickenpox, but yet they require you to wear an N95 mask, right? So, so that is what I'm really worried about is we're never going to get to the sensible place of that, that we're gonna let people drive their cars because there's a chance you could get in a wreck. So um, it, we'll get there eventually, right? Um, but again, the states are going to be different. Some states are going to be much tighter lockdown, and and some states are open again. You know, essentially. Yeah. Right, and and I think this is actually the strength of our federal system in the sense that every state mm-hmm. controls yeah. their policy, because I think you can clearly see with states that are making sense. I mean, I don't know if you look at a lot of the curves. I know, well, I know you do. Look at the, the different response curves of of cases, or you know, we can. That's a totally different discussion. I don't want to have right now, but. Uh, when you look at positive PCR tests and stuff, it, it is hard to look at that and find any discernible policy that makes a significant difference in, you know, whether you don't have right. anything open or you've got everything right. open or you wear mask mandates, you don't have mask yeah. mandates, you have close gatherings, you don't have. I mean, it seems to be totally independent, which is, in, to your point initially, it actually makes a lot of sense because people are it's really not laws that are sort of preventing the spread. It's people making individual decisions on like, boy doesn't seem like a good idea to go to a restaurant right now. Like I was yeah. walking around with N95 everywhere for about eh, six to eight weeks because I'm not worried about COVID-19, but I sure don't want to get it if I don't have to. Mm-hmm. I don't wear it now because I'm like, yeah, the community's prevalence is pretty low. I'm not as concerned about it. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, so, so, so that's exactly right is that you can, as a individual, as an educated person, you can look at the risks out there and make your own decisions. But but then, you know, retrospectively, when we look back and say California was really locked down, they really squeezed their economy hard by preventing outbreaks of cases. Well, how effective was that? You know, it worked for a while, right? And then it didn't work at all. And it's because people get sick of being told what to do, don't they? Yeah. And they stop doing it. So that, that's the thing is that when cases are low, we got to open it up. You know, you, you got to let people do what they want to do. And then you have at least the hope when you ask, when you say, hey, folks, percent positives really going up fast. Let's do a little bit of things a little bit different. Let's take a little bit more care. You know, you hope that there's going to be a response to that. I tend to think that public education and recommendations are all that's really need needed. And I don't think mandates and laws passed are necessary unless you're trying to do something long term, like unless you think you have to do something for months. It's not going to make a significant difference. And, and I think we've seen that, right? I think, you know, you can't go to restaurants. And so people go to have dinner with their friends. And so they go to their houses and things like that. Yeah. Because if you have set a, if you set any sort of policy, not recognizing human nature, whatever you want to call it, the fact that we have to, we're social creatures, right? You're fundamentally going to fail. Like if you don't take that into account, you, you can't succeed. Which I guess brings me to an interesting story about New Zealand and Australia. And I want to sort of close with this because... We, we talked about them earlier that they got a little bit of cases got in New Zealand. New Zealand's trumpeted and sort of held up as the ideal by lots of people because it's a Western nation. It's a free society. Yet they've basically prevented any, as far as we can tell, there's not any coronavirus in on the island. You know, maybe except in their isolation centers. But there's a two week isolation quarantine period when you come into the country. There's a and I think, you know, usually traveling other places is two weeks, but you're burning like you're burning a couple of weeks of travel, you know, whether it's business or pleasure. So essentially you've made that entire island nation an open air prison in some ways. Now you can do whatever you want when you're on the island. It seems like they're pretty open, but the cost of that is that you can't leave. <laughs> and, and they already, they stated, I think last, this last week that it's at least going through the end of this year, if not longer, that they're going to continue to lockdown. The implications for that, I mean, I think they're wise in that they recognize that you can't ever open it up until everyone's vaccinated and whatever. I mean, I guess that's the, what do you think about the cost of that? And uh, I think that would, it's going to cause all sorts of problems for their country economically. And, you know, I don't know. I mean, I just think it's, it's probably kind of a crazy, crazy plan. Yeah. Well, well, that's the key. Can you um, isolate on your own without bringing anyone um, to your society for long enough 
for as long as it takes to get the vaccine there, you know. So um, Alaska tried it, Hawaii tried it. So how, how successful were they? But, you know, it's funny, we're doing the same darn thing again with these new quote unquote strains, right? Yeah. We're, we're not allowing people to travel from England and from Brazil and um, South Africa. You know, yeah. So how well did containment work the first time? So uh, unless you're willing to do what China does, unless you're willing to do what New Zealand does, containment doesn't work. I mean, we've proven that time and time again. Are Is anyone in the United States willing to do what New Zealand did? Are they willing to do what China did to get rid of this virus? What's the cost? Yeah. Well, I mean, I see people all the time sort of flippantly saying, well, we just need to shut everything down for a couple of weeks yeah. and then we get to stomp this thing. But no yeah. one really thinks about what they're actually saying. I mean, yeah. And I'm so sick of, you know, all this talk about this state is winning and this state is doing worse and this is the worst state. You know, we've got to do this math taking in, in a, into account the downsides of the actions that they did, right? What were the effects on the economy? What were the effects on school-aged kids? You know, what was the effect on learning? Um, what were the societal effects of these these choices? It's not just about, you know, it's unfortunate people die, but it's not just about people dying, Right. Yes. And, and that actually reminds me of one final question. You know, when in the book from Killer to Common Cold, Herd Protection, the Transitional Phase in COVID-19, you talk about mutations because you hear people talking about it all the time. I think there are, I don't know, 10,000 variants that have been found of, of SARS-CoV-2 that are, that's why they can kind of find out if you actually truly been reinfected. They can look at the genetic, uh, there were 1,200 proteins that are coded on these, uh, in the RNA for the, the virus. And so you have things that are shifted or moved around and so you can tell if it's a different variant. Anyway, there are variants that are concerned that it may actually dodge the the vaccination the, because the mRNA is focused on one part of the spike protein. If that spike protein is different for these variants, is it going to provide protection? So I guess it's sort of a two-part question. Do you worry about the variant? Do you worry about mutations happening so that it's going to evade our immune system? My hunch is probably no. And the other question is, do you think that it's really mutating quickly as people suggest it is because my impression it's really not you know and, and it's been mutating this whole time and then why are people paying attention to it now it's because the media is using it to drum up a scare tactic right so cases are going down in the united states so they can't scare people anymore so what do they do they, they drum up these variants that said the number of viruses around the world is directly cor correlated to how many variants there are. So we had a lot of virus in the, in the world in the last couple months, so there's going to be a lot of variants, right? Sure. So what you find, um, and you find this with HIV, is that variations come at a cost. Okay. If you have something that, that goes away from the wild type virus, generally it's a less fit virus. Okay. So we find that quite frequently that any sort of change has a cost in the fitness of the virus. So in general, if a variant can escape the immune system, it should not be as fit of a variant. It should not cause as many problems. There's a lot to say about that. The immune system is what it is. Evolution acts on the immune system and on the virus. In general, if we stop testing people with the more benign forms of this, and we really focus on the more malignant forms of it, we should allow this to evolve to be more of a benign virus. And, and I know that's, that's kind of a loaded suggestion. I'm suggesting we don't test people who are asymptomatic because who cares if they have the virus, right? What we want, we're not going to get rid of this virus. We want to allow it to, to evolve into the common cold, that's going to happen through natural infection and vaccination. But why would we not use evolution towards our ad ad advantage and select out the variants that actually benefit both the virus and humans? So that's the key is that we need to um, select the variant of the virus that actually does the best for the virus and for humans. Do we risk putting a selection pressure on the virus uh, with a with a vaccine? Like the, we like, we, for instance, we're vaccinating against whatever the standard coronavirus. I mean, that's a bad way of putting it, but the standard SARS CoV two that one spike protein. By doing that, are we encouraging other variants that may be more dangerous? You know, of expressing themselves, and is that a, is that a risk? 
I don't think so. So, uh, you know, for a couple reasons is because, you know, the way that it attaches to our cells is via this lock and key. So it's a very yeah. specific sequence of nucleic acids that it needs to have in order to get into humans. So as soon as it alters that to escape our immune system, it's like changing your key. The key no longer works in the door and you may not recognize that key anymore, but it doesn't work. So, you know, again, we can certainly get escape mutants, but one would theorize that those escape mutants would not be as fit. Um, and then actually the virus would revert back to the wild type because that's the fittest virus of all. And finally, this I promise the last question. Um, I hear I oftentimes mentioned that the immune response from the vaccine is more robust than the immune response from a wild type infection. Can you explain how that's possible? Because I think you know, most people, th- I've seen comment many times like, well, if I'm going to get it, if I'm going to get immunity, I'd rather get it in the wild because I'm going to have a better immune response than if I get a vaccine, which is just going to be limited to a certain amount of antibodies that maybe this, maybe a variant doesn't have. And so it's not going to be as effective. Can you, can you speak to how any vaccine could be actually better than a natural infection? Show me the data. I don't think it is. So, and, and, you know, people will point to toxin mediated diseases such as like diphtheria, where of course, if you get a vaccine against a toxin that is causing the disease, well, of course the vaccine is going to work better than the disease, right? But for a non-toxin mediated disease, I don't know, we have an example where vaccine is more effective at preventing disease than a natural infection is. And in fact, I don't think there's any data with SARS-CoV-2 that supports that either. Well, I appreciate the discussion. It was uh, great as always. Um, Again, I would encourage people to purchase your book, From Killer to Common Cold, Herd Protection in the Transitional Phase of COVID-19. There's an audio version that is discounted, I think, probably cheaper, that I narrate, which, um, you know, I'd be happy to... uh, send you a free link. If the first nine people who email me, I can, I've got actually a free copy that you can get. So you can do that at the Paradox Show at protonmail.com. And then I would encourage you to go to fiphysician.com. That's where uh, Dr. Graham does lots of his writings on this. And then obviously financial stuff too. Any final thoughts or I think we kind of talked away, talked out of all, all that there is about COVID. Well, I get, we've been doing this about every two months. So we'll, we'll see how life is different in uh, March and, and go from there. Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, my hope is two months from now, a lot more, we've gotten past the phase one, whatever, you know, that means yeah. as far as the, the teachers and the elderly have gotten vaccinated. I mean, you would think if you get to that point and you have most people va- elderly vaccinated, which I think their adoption rates are much higher than the general population. Uh, I think you're going to reduce your death, death rate significantly. And then, I don't know. So I think we've got, we've got a race going on. We've got a race between vaccination and how long it will be before, you know, most people get a third wave. Um, so I, I don't, I can't answer the question. I bet there's going to be some places where it comes back again before we get enough people vaccinated. You know, we're, we're going to have to see. It's, it's going, to, going to be a community by community um, thing to watch. Yeah. And it is random. Obviously we don't, you can't predict that sort of thing. Dr. David Graham, thanks so much for being on the paradox. And I encourage you to go to paradox.com slash one fourteen to find the show notes and links to all the stuff. Great. Thanks Eric. Before we go, be sure to use your 15% off code for on time MD by Dr. Phil Bauscher to gain control of your life, your focus and your time. Reach out at drpodcastnetwork.com slash on time MD and use code 2021 at checkout. <laughs> Thanks for listening to The Paradox. If you like what The Doc is doing, please subscribe and leave a review on iTunes or Stitcher. And share the show with your friends. Become a supporting listener to get access to special bonuses at patreon.com forward slash theparadox. Show notes can be found at theparadox.com. 